When I saw you walk the city streets, I heard you listen to the voice of fallen leaves on the forest floor. This too was an accumulation, this heap of leaves, this gathering of open veins, a compost of dreams exhausted from harvesting the light of a bleak sun. Order prevails in Warsaw. Order prevails in Berlin. Order prevails in Bombay. Unidentified adult female, torso, found in water. Time of death, unknown, but probably prior to drowning. Cause of death, unknown, may be violent, but in the absence of skull, appendages, and upper vertebrae, cannot be ascertained. Decomposition remains arrested due to advanced stage of adipocere formation caused by prolonged submergence in water. Order prevails in the factory. Order prevails in the prison. Order prevails in the mall. They were exhausted. They were hungry. They came to the victorious city, stepped out of a thousand trains onto a thousand platforms, in a never-ending Victoria terminus, onto Alexanderplatz, in Majalkovska, to eat, to sleep, to dream. They came bearing with them the dust of hinterlands, the ashes of war, and the aftertaste of famines. They were the forest, the mountain, the desert, the scar of an open-cast mine. They came every day, day after day. The forest withers. The mountain falls on its knees. The desert turns into a mirage. The mine makes money, and then some more, and then the seam runs dry. A factory closes, a mall refuses to open. Variable capital becomes constant and then metastasizes. Living labor dies and awaits its post-mortem turn on a gurney in a forensic laboratory. The city grows, breaks its banks. You make a note on a page. The accumulation of capital. capital needs to and underneath the, the note you write where the book should have begun. Unidentified adult female. Seeing that the overwhelming majority of resources and labor power is in fact still in the orbit of free capitalist production, this being the historical milieu of accumulation, capital must go all out to obtain ascendancy over these territories and social organizations. She will tell you her name. My name is Lakshmi Surabgur. And yes, it is an improbable name. A name chosen to hide other names. A name thrown with a laugh, like a throw of dice. She will offer no explanation for herself. She will, however, offer to write her name, just so you know what she means. She will not give you an address, not even a forwarding address or a clear reply about her profession. She once said, I change nationalities more often than shoes. And I like changing shoes. I have seen her stand very still, demure but defiant in a sari, with that bindi on her temple, under the shadow of the Palace of Science and Culture in Warsaw. What promise was it that detained her there? She won't say. Here in Bombay, she waits again. Most of the chapters of the book that was written and not yet written, as well as the remaining personal effects, are kept in a trunk on a landing in a Fanaswadi chol, in the care of some children dear to her. If you don't meet her, at least try and find the trunk. Questions keep appearing in the margins of her notes. 
Have you seen an outside to your life? What will you carry when you flee? Who will you take when told never to come back? She said she was shaped by these questions. She said that cities of the 20th century were shaped by these questions. She got many kinds of answers. Divergent, contradictory, sometimes precise, sometimes ironic, sometimes humorous, sometimes containing a vast expanse of people, things and places. strange city of extras, technicians, animals, artisans, fortune seekers, stars, crashing comets, satellites and men with cash grows in the forest, right here in Waltersdorf. The tower was its sentry, standing guard over this now lost city of illusions, as it conjured the dream of empires the great war could have won for Germany and its Kaiser, if only it had all turned out differently. Inside the tower, the film stills in the vitrines conjure distant worlds of make-believe. Exotic Indian princesses and dancing girls, hot-blooded swordsmen, temples to strange gods in tropical jungle. There are elephants, tigers and tiger tamers. The dreams made here could just as well have been manufactured in Bombay, but Waltersdorf is on the outskirts of Berlin. The New York Times, January 15, 1922. A curious column devoted to a comparison of trade between Germany and India. German foreign trade, in a slump ever since the war, has been positively affected by the boycott of British goods due to the intensity of the non-cooperation movement in India. 60 tons in 1919 of processed hide and skin sales to Germany rose to 3,700 tons in 1921 and 6,000 tons in 1922. Suddenly, the sets of German films had a lot of tiger skins. Technicians from Waltersdorf began cranking cameras on Bombay film sets. Lower down on the same page of the newspaper, there are reports of a troubled day in Berlin. The posthumous publication by Paul Levy of a pamphlet critical of the Bolsheviks by Rosa Luxemburg has caused a near scandal. Communist Party functionaries denounced Levy and his breakaway faction, saying Rosa Luxemburg had herself changed her mind about her own criticism of the Bolsheviks and had suppressed this before she was killed. The New York Times puts trade figures between Germany and India and the curious fate of the thoughts of Rosa Luxemburg on the same page. Sometimes a newspaper can be read like a tarot card. Cemeteries mark the edge of cities. When you fall out of life, you fall out of the city. One way to understand the historical growth of a city is to see where cemeteries appear. They usually radiate outwards, like points on the rings of a tree trunk in concentric circles from the historic center. Each epoch of city development adds another necropolitan notch along the radius of urban accumulation. The Friedrichsfelder Cemetery in Lichtenberg was not yet a part of Berlin in 1919. At the end of the 19th century, the mortuary of the Charité Hospital on Heimstrasse in Berlin was restructured along scientific lines to cope with the growing pressure of the unclaimed dead. For a while it set the world standard for a bespoke, efficient, scientific tribute to the last stand of the unknown citizen. Separate facilities for the display, storage and autopsy of cadavers were incorporated. Gold rooms created in the basement for keeping bodies that could not be identified. Ducts were sunk into walls and ceilings for the circulation of air. Hydraulic lifts were installed for the transportation of bodies and channels dug on the floor 
for the draining of fluids. Vitrines were built for the exhibition of exceptional specimens. And still, the mortuary was overcrowded. This is where people came to search for a missing friend or relative. Standing in front of a glass enclosed identification platform, they would see a body raised diagonally, the face uncovered. Up the stairs in a corridor stood an arched vitrine. For decades, this vitrine held an unidentified adult female torso. She was found in water and kept to demonstrate the effects of drowning on human tissue to students of forensic medicine. Professors duly noted, time of death unknown. The body that was buried um, on the 13th of June 1919 as Rosa Luxemburg was definitely not her body. Um, because if you look at the autopsy protocol, the autopsy protocol from this year, um, you have no identification of this female as Rosa Luxemburg. Um, on the opposite, you have a lot of hints that can't be her, um, so this was not Rosa Luxemburg buried there. We have a body that, uh, of a female that has the exact stature, the body proportions, and the height of Rosa Luxemburg. The isotope, uh, isotope analyzer says um, this woman lived 90 years, ag 90 years ago in the time of Rosa Luxemburg. Um, the computer tomography says this woman was between 40 and 50 years uh, as she died. And um, we found with radiology and CT analysis a uh, degeneration of the pelvic. And this body has no identification. So what is the reason to keep a body stored for 90 years without identification? The only explanation is um, she can't be identified because her identity, Rosa Luxemburg, was, was in a grave with another body. Out of the 17 women's bodies fished out of the Landwehr Canal in the spring of 1919, one woman's body stayed in the vitrine at the Charité. Another was buried in the Friedrichsfelde Cemetery, together with the body considered to be that of Karl Liebknecht. Once this body was thought to have been that of Rosa Luxemburg. Now, no one really knows for sure. Who was she? The Nazis disinterred and erased the body. The anonymous cadaver that had perhaps stood in bravely for the dead Rosa went missing again. A lost missing person. The rumor, among students and staff at the Charité at least, was that Rosa never left the building. The vitrine is empty. The missing person has gone missing again. And then Berlin swallowed Friedrichsfelde. The capital digested its outside. We are all numbers today, a datum, a statistic, a measure. How many are we? How much of ourselves are we? How deficient or how much in excess are we? How liquid, how solvent, how current, how prolific? How dense, deep and dubious are we? What are we worth? How much do we weigh in with the world? What discount do we offer on ourselves? What is our rank, the percentage of our takings? How high is our perch, how deep our abyss, how shallow our grave? How curious that there should be no contradiction between the urge to invade and the injunction against trespass. <laughs> There is another current, alternating, oscillating, interfering, turning the pages of time.
I cure myself of vertigo by climbing towers and forests. Looking down, I can imagine a fall arrested by the interlocked branches of trees. That keeps me from throwing myself from the tower. Every forest has a canopy to cushion the fall of those who dare rise above their station or undertake any modest uprising. Each forest has a canopy of undergrowth and compost to soften every footfall. A teeming network of life above and below sustains what goes on between earth and sky. In a sudden clearing in a corner of the slow incremental forest of Dharavi in Mumbai stands a volcanic crater, its ash fertilizing and baking countless clay mugs. The mugs make their way into tea shops. The tea, a sweet, hot cutting of chai, injects a shot of caffeine and calories into a multitude of bodies. A spark of energy jolts the body out of the fog of fatigue. The spark sets off a flame of concentrated labor. Work continues till the next tea break. Calories burn like forest fires on the second shift of the working day. And the working day is full of working bodies. I lift, I carry, I enter a multitude of keystrokes, I watch the clock, I drive, I strip, I skin, I shear, I turn blades, I join, I screw, I fuck, I smelt, I stir, I pick, I choose, I count, I hold, I throw, I heave, I weld. I go from door to door to door with things to sell. I fly, I turn the pages of a million files. I clean mountains of dust. I gather kilotons of garbage. I cover up after. Sometimes I just wait. Sometimes I run on empty. Every tea break is a battle, a campaign in the long history of class antagonism. How often, how long, when, where shall we drink tea? Every second and every calorie is fought for on the shop floor. Each fraction of time saved is put away in trying to understand the ghost in the machine. Workers write, read, collect figures and statistics, haunt libraries and printing presses, publish, converse, argue, drink tea and class struggle deep into the night. Solidarity is inhaled with every shared cigarette. Gdansk and Warsaw are translated into Hindi and Marathi, but the longest strike in the history of the world turns into the biggest lockout. Textile mill after textile mill closes its gate. The outside flows into the megacity. The land is absorbed. The body is spat out. Bombay becomes a city with a hole in its heart. Elsewhere, at another edge of the forest of Mumbai, a mall and the back office complex have parachuted onto a garbage dump. People who work here speak of their computers malingering. The untreated garbage under the foundations is releasing fumes that interfere with electrical signals. Perhaps these fumes make workers uneasy, which in turn makes for an accumulation of errors. The undergrowth haunts my working day. The city, compliant to the demands of expansion, capital's highest image of itself, grows at astonishing speed with the money spun out of the debris of the working day. Records are set for endurance. A stadium grows out of the rubble of post-Second World War Warsaw. Construction workers are asked to set records, to hit targets, just like sprinters and sharpshooters. Some even get medals. At the city centre grows the shiny new MDM development, 
personally supervised by the President of the People's Republic. New houses for new bodies. An old facility is renamed the Rosa Luxemburg Electric Light Bulb Factory to honor a heroine of the working classes. Millions of light bulbs glow, turning night into day, stretching the hours of work time, filling the after hours city with adventure, with pleasures freely sought and given. When Lenin said communism equals workers' power plus electricity, did he know that the equation could also be written as communism minus workers' power equals electricity? Can the relations that we desire be written in terms of addition and subtraction? Unravel a productivity index and you get plenty of detail. Eye strain, repetitive stress injury, the toxicity of mercury, the shortening of breaks, and the intrusion of the supervisor. You also get daydreams, chit-chat, gossip, rumors, the thousandfold daily mutinies and routine skirmishes between desire and order. A little more voltage in the soul to combat the exhaustion of the body, and then again some more. Who has ever measured revoltage? And now, when the lights have dimmed and the records tapered, the athletic excesses of the plan are abandoned. The Rosa Luxemburg electric light bulb factory grows derelict, awaiting redevelopment. The building acquires a new ecology. The market's invisible hand is a fractured limb. Historically, the factory turns into a suitable venue for undertaking new readings of the accumulation of capital. The undergrowth haunts my memory of production. And which in this life it corrodes and assimilates. Thus capital cannot accumulate. The stadium, a ball full of inverted sky, becomes untended. A Vietnamese street market engulfs its perimeter. New life forms emerge in the undergrowth of informal exchange. Here now is the last international, a Babel reborn in Babylon. Vendors from Mozambique, porters from Iraq, Vietnamese cooks and North Indian waiters, gypsies, Bosnians, Czechs, Ukrainians, Chinese, and even some Poles. A canopy of solidarities, a network of need. It sends tendrils shooting across the empty space of a failed dream, making it live to a different rhythm. You can be thrown outside yourself when faced with the impatience of capital. The every effort to return is an encroachment. When she stood in Warsaw, on Marzhaukowska Street, looking at the replica of herself, she had to think about how to stop life from turning to stone. A photographic album is a hard-working mnemonic machine, but its yields drop as the years go by. A portrait. A portrait. A picnic. A picnic. A party. A party, party congress. A party a congress. Prisoner, a gregarious a prisoner, aunt. A proud a nephew. A gregarious aunt. Casimir a proud Luxembourg, nephew. Luxembourg, 97 years Casimir old. Casimir Luxembourg. Of Warsaw. 97 Gulag, years old. Leningrad. Of Warsaw. And Vilnius. The Gulag. Leningrad. Casimir. The dentist. 
Casimir, Casimir the dentist. The cyclist. Casimir, Casimir the cyclist. The archivist. Casimir, Casimir the archivist. The pensioner. Casimir, Casimir the pensioner. The survivor. Casimir the survivor. The twentieth century's rough passage hasn't robbed him of serenity, or cheapened his own slow fade into the twilight. His Aunt Rosa's herbarium, constructed mainly in prison, bears an impression of a garden in her mind. These flowers have crossed continents, dipped in and out of secrecy, done time in lockers. Desiccated, delicate, devoted to detail, the pages of the herbarium are scoured for DNA in an archive in Warsaw, its last resting place. Rosa has left no trace of her body on its pages, only the stain of her curiosity. Casimir's DNA is too distant a match. The molecules turn forgetful as they skip a degree of kinship. He wants nothing to do with the political stuff. Nothing can ever be certain between the aunt and her nephew, except in the territory of photographs and dreams. Does Dr. Luxembourg ever dream of his aunt? a portrait jej znajdował się u ojca w gabinecie, znaczy jak był stół, tam był taki tapczan skórzany dla chorych i na ścianie był jej duży portret, autoportret. Ona sama malowała się siebie. W tym, jeżeli o to chodzi, była bardzo zdolna. Się wchodziło, przepraszam. We were there, beside her and Karl Liebknecht, hardly a heartbeat away. We, the beasts of Berlin Zoo, saw Rosa Luxemburg by the canal, next to the outer fence of our prison, on that night of January the 15th, 1919. We were there. We were there. Captive in our cages. We were there. Helpless. Watching, listening, restless. We were there. Knowing in our skin, in our tightening tendons, in our claws and our bones, the approach of the moment of her slaughter. We saw her standing, utterly exhausted, perfectly still. Perhaps she turned in our direction? We know how they hit her. We know how they tied sacks of cement and stones to her neck, her ankles, her wrists. First they killed Karl, then they fell Rosa. Order prevailed in Berlin that night. We know what drowned with her.
Gone was that accumulation of human frailties, that limped, that cursed, that made herbariums in rote revolution, that preferred the company of birds and beasts to pedants in party buses. Gone were the feet that conspired to defeat the restraints of borders. Gone were the eyes that saw ties binding the mine shaft beyond the equator to the prison at the city's heart. Gone was the thread that even a tiger in a cage could unspool to its liberty. How many times must I sit at the Café Universal in anticipation of your arrival, Lakshmi, with bulletins and chess pieces practicing melancholic moves against invisible adversaries and friends while I wait? And there's always a, a game spread open for your pleasure. Like in Zimmerwald. I sat in the Café Voltaire. Rosa was in prison. I was her anonymous messenger. Remember Zimmerwald? I can never forget her ornithologist's congresses. One time, Rosa asked me to do bird calls. She knew of my gift. She wanted to play a game to see if the birds of a middle European forest could respond to the voices of their Indian comrades. So I, I sang the arcing lament of a great Indian Saraskrit. Rosa reminded everyone present, as only she would, that its proper name was Grus Antigone Antigone. She asked if anyone could discern in the voice of the Saras Crane an echo of the first defiance of the citadel, the law of the state. She said, we should never let them claim the memory of our defeats as the chronicle of their victories. Like Antigone, she said, we should watch over our dead. We should insist on our own account of their passing. You pretended to be ornithologists to fox the secret police of 14 countries, but the Dadaists in the table next to you thought you lot were Freemasons. And you thought that there were snake oil salesmen. I played chess. I beat Illich, you know. Enough reminiscence, Grandmaster Hyder and Clara. Let's get down to business. Make your move. I have decided to stop letting myself be turned into stone. That's easier said than done, you know. Some would say it's easier done than said. And enough's been said already. Someone needs to write what is to be undone. I am in my time, and you are in yours. Between us, we have a century on this table. We have looked too long to find the face of capital. We thought we could turn a mirror to Medusa's head, but the mirror became a mask. And we found her image infecting our vision. Like birds with mirrors, we have fought with our own reflection. We fought images with images, and we are like exhausted birds who have succumbed to the hardness of the surface that they were railing against. So how do you stop being imprisoned by this mirror? How do we stop analysis from turning into fatalism and then fatally wounding us? You can allow yourself to be surprised by what the world might become. You know, as a lion tamer at the Berlin Zoo, and later when I handled tigers at, for the Indian films at 
Waltersdorf, I was always surprised to see how the animals always translated baits into morsels, and then morsels into baits, like philosophers, forever interpreting the world. When you think capital, you isolate one image, and you think you have overcome capital by turning that image inside out or upside down, and you think that you have gone beyond that image. But what you forget is that capital is not an image, not an object, not a state form, but a social relation exceeding the power of representation. And dice games never end. And revolution never wins. It just is. You still make your moves. You look for openings. You keep looking for openings. You make, you flee, you turn, you be, you nest, you grow. You find ways to create the life you are no longer prepared to defer to an unknown future. It is not desirable for the future to be captive to the present, just as it is unthinkable that the present be held hostage by the future. Neither the arrow nor the boomerang of time. You decide your capacities. You decide when to change them, accelerate them. You become its protagonist. You're not alone, Lakshmi. Everything has a shadow. A past, a future. Something invisible as yet uncounted. Still waiting to be figured. We wax, we wane, we add years to our lives, we come to the end of our days. But we are many. Our name is Legion. And sometimes we are possessed of more things than even we can know. Why would it be otherwise? The fear of being turned into stone is only a momentary arrest in the world's coursing through you. For a change, Apollonices keeps vigil over an Antigone's body outside the gates of Thebes. Is it time to settle accounts, to look for what was lost and what was found in the last 90 years? On the credit side, there's a sort of habeas corpus. We finally have a body, even if it is only a body. We know who she is, but we cannot take her name. On the debit side, we lost the plot. What can you do with the body if you can't take her name? What use is an addition in the statistics of disappearance? Who will tend an unmarked grave? Something is still missing. A sense of closure, a drawing of lines, a marking of limits. Limits. In the equation between what the world is and what we want it to be, why is it that the question of limits generally weighs in on the side of the questioned, rarely, if ever, on the side of the obeyed? As if to hear, what exists, exists. The reality of capital is also its eternity. We're also at the same time to be told, be realistic what you ask for there are limits to how much can be altered. How many more times will this be heard? Why are there no limits to what we are told cannot be altered? Or is it just that we are avoiding asking this question? A missing body is like an absent question. What is it that is not being said? These are the rumours that trouble the street 
the doubts that keep you awake, the whispers that unseat. It is being said, and it is being denied. Rosa never left the building. The capital of accumulation has not yet resolved the question of what it must do to bury the casualties of the accumulation of capital. It does not matter that these consequences are still denied a name. It all depends on what you choose to hear. Can a factory die in one place and be born in another? Strange things happen when factories die. Their specters keep escaping the confines of their makeshift morgues. Inside, I am on the side of outside. If you twist and fold a ribbon of space, what was inside a moment ago could end up as the outside. When a surface cracks, the crack is the surface. The outside is as much within something as without. You have other plans. You have a getaway car. You're in a roll, aren't you? Your rear view mirror is so badly askew that you see far ahead whenever you look behind you. There's no escaping the future when you pursue the past. Now try saying that in your head, the other way around. Horizon. Horizon. Two thousand fragments of possibility. Foraging quietly for the future. Across the mud flats there will be a special economic zone. A new mega city that takes six months, not sixty nor six hundred to build. A six-lane highway will span the distance to a six-month city. The drawings are done. Maybe 2,000 flamingos have other ideas. They just turn up to embarrass you with their obstinate attachment to this forsaken world. They refuse to move. They mess things up, they say. Deal with me. I was, I am, I will be. And then what do you do? What can you do? The earth moves sluggishly, and life takes its time to grow, to move, to fly, to mate, to nest, to feed even to die. Capital needs a swifter wobble about the planetary axis, shorter seasons, brief lunch breaks, a snappier interval between one working day and another. Something more pliable than that slow, variable capital, that wet mass called humans. 
The city has gone so far, grown so fast, that the edge has come to the center. The flamingos are now inside the city. The map is out of date. How discontinuous, how surprising, how interrupted, how asynchronous, how mysterious, how quixotic things have been. And there's no accounting for contingencies either. For the perversity of protagonists distributed all across the mud flats of time, nourishing themselves on signs of life drowned in the water. Flamingos getting russet by the hour as they feed. Someday, they'll be as red as Rosa. Rosa Luxemburg writes to Sonia Liebknecht from Rotswaf Prison, mid-November 1917. I was recently reading a scientific work upon the migrations of birds, a phenomenon which has hitherto seemed rather enigmatic. From this I learned that certain species, which at ordinary times live at enmity one with another because some are birds of prey whilst others are victims, will keep the peace during their great southward flight across the sea. Among the birds that come to winter in Egypt come in such numbers that the sky is darkened by their flight are, besides hawks, eagles, falcons and owls, thousands of little songbirds such as larks, golden-crested wrens and nightingales, mingling fearlessly with the great birds of prey. A truce of God seems to have been declared for the journey. All are striving towards the common goal, to drop half dead from fatigue in the land of the Nile, and subsequently to assort themselves by species and localities. Nay more, during the long flight, the larger birds have been seen to carry smaller birds on their backs. Cranes have passed in great numbers with the twittering freight of small birds of passage. Comrade Crow, choose your flamingo. Choose your time. Fly. Thank <laughs> you. 